The autonomic nervous system is that part of our nervous system that controls all of those things that happen in our body that we don't have to think about every day. Things like our heart rate, our blood pressure, temperature regulation, how quickly our GI system moves, many, many other things. Hi, I'm Dr. Claire Francamano, and this is my YouTube channel where we talk about all things related to Ehlers-Danlos syndromes and the hypermobility spectrum disorders. Today we're going to be talking about dysautonomia. And dysautonomia is an umbrella term that we use to describe dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. And this is a, something that really underlies many, many of the symptoms that people with the hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, other types of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and the hypermobility spectrum disorders experience. So first, let's talk a little bit about the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is that part of our nervous system that controls all of those things that happen in our body that we don't have to think about every day. Things like our heart rate, our blood pressure, temperature regulation, how quickly our GI system moves, many, many other things. So things like temperature intolerance, gastrointestinal dysmotility, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS, all of these things can fall under the broad umbrella of dysautonomia. Now, the autonomic nervous system has two basic parts. We call them the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. And the sympathetic nervous system controls those reactions that we think of as fight or flight. And the parasympathetic, just to put it in a very simple way, controls the rest and digest functions. And the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems usually operate, you can think of it kind of like a seesaw. When one is up, the other one's down, and vice versa. So if the sympathetic nervous system is on overdrive because the body perceives that it is under threat for some reason, then the parasympathetic functions of rest and digest will not be working as well. And unfortunately, this is the situation that many people with hypermobility find themselves in because of the instability in their joints, the chronic pain, the mast cell activation that many people experience, the body feels like it is under threat. And therefore, the stress response is high and those rest and digest functions are not working very well. So as a consequence, the body is not able to adjust to balance the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems and people are living in a state of constant fight or flight. So what are the things that happen as a result of this? Well, GI motility may not be great. And as a result, we have many patients with chronic constipation, gastroparesis, inability to digest nutrients, and abdominal pain and bloating that may occur as a result of failure for the GI tract to move properly. In the cardiovascular system, if the heart is not able to respond properly uh, to blood pooling in the legs, then we get tachycardia. And why does blood pool in the legs? Well, because the connective tissue in the veins allows those veins to dilate. And we know from studies that have been published in the peer-reviewed literature that people can put up to a third of their blood volume in their feet and their legs, and that does not leave enough blood circulating to adequately provide oxygen to the heart and the lungs and the brain. So the heart starts working overtime and is going rapidly, what we call tachycardia, and that results in the sensation of you might have a feeling of palpitations and just not, not getting enough blood to the heart and the lungs and the uh, brain. So how can we address these things? Well, 
One thing that we can do is make sure that the circulating blood volume in the body is optimized. And that involves making sure that you've got enough to drink and enough salt to enable your kidneys to hold on to that water that you're drinking. Because the kidneys are designed to balance out the salt and the water. So if you're drinking a lot of extra water, but you're not taking in any extra salt or electrolytes, your body is just automatically going to pee it out. And then it doesn't do any good. It doesn't help improve that circulating blood volume, which you need to maintain adequate circulation to all the parts of your body. So enough water. And what do we say, what is enough water? In general, the recommendation is take your weight in pounds, divide that by two, and that's the number of ounces of water that you should be drinking every single day. Most of us don't get anywhere near that amount. So if you're, you hear that number and you say, whoa, no way, I can't do that, just take it slow and start increasing gradually and gradually work your way up to where you're drinking about half your weight in ounces of water every day. In terms of salt, Many people crave salty snacks because their body is just telling them they need that salt to hold on to the water and increase their circulating blood volume. Another way, so you can get salt from your dietary intake, you can also use salt supplement capsules. There's a brand called Salt Stick, which many people find to be useful. And then there are numerous other electrolyte supplements available on the market now. A uh, new one, NUUN, is one that I've been recommending for many years. There's Liquid IV, Propel. There are many, many different options in terms of electrolyte supplementation. So that's one thing, water and salt. And then compression socks or stockings can also help because remember, I was talking about how the veins dilate and you're putting all that blood volume in your feet and your legs. The compression stockings can help the blood return to the core and provide increased volume to provide blood to the lungs, the heart, and the brain. So that's the basics, is salt and water and compression. But there's also the element of what do we do about this feeling that the body is under threat, that sympathetic overdrive. And some things that we can do include meditation, exercise, making sure we're getting good sleep, we have good social connections. All of these things to tell, tell us, to tell the body, to help us feel that we are in a safe environment. So there are a number of guided meditation apps out there now that can really make it easy to spend five or 10 minutes in a guided meditation. Um, there's an app called Calm, C-A-L-M, another one called Headspace. A third one is Insight Timer. All of these have free options or free trials that you can use to see how it feels to just get into that meditative practice and help your body tone down that fight or flight reaction. Another thing is exercise. We know that exercise is very, very important for the body, but also that people who are in that fight or flight situation, and especially people who are experiencing chronic pain, sometimes feel like, like I, I can't possibly exercise, it irks too much. So we have to find a balance and what you want to do is start very slowly and gradually increase because as you use your body and as those muscles get used to getting back into shape and toning and strengthening, that will improve your ability to support the super flexible body and will help with the pain and eventually will help with this imbalance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And of course, making social connections is very important. You need your social network. And the online social support groups can be very helpful for this, but it's also really important to see people in person. And nothing beats a good hug from a loved person to help tell you that everything is well and you're feeling safe. So these are just a few ideas to help improve the autonomic imbalance. There are some resources out there if you're interested in taking a deeper dive and learning more 
about the autonomic nervous system, I strongly recommend uh, a book by Dr. Peter Rowe, which was just published this year, called Living Well with Orthostatic Intolerance. This was published by the Johns Hopkins University Press. There's a lot of great information at the website for Dysautonomia International. And there's also a book by Dr. Stephen Porges, P-O-R-G-E-S, called The Polyvagal Theory, which talks a lot about the vagus nerve, which is the main nerve of the parasympathetic nervous system, and the role that it plays in that rest and digest function and also feeling safe and being sociable. So the polyvagal theory is another thing to learn more about if you're interested in taking a deeper dive into the autonomic nervous system. Finally, Dr. Leslie Russett, who is an outstanding physical therapist who's been very involved with the educational initiatives of the ehlers Danlo Society, has a series of lectures that she calls Hypermobility 101, and she has a lecture on POTS and POTS management, which I recommend to you, and that is available on her website at Clarkson University. So that's a wrap for dysautonomia in hypermobility. And I'm so glad you chose to spend this time with me today. Hope to see you again soon.